what I was talking about. Was I just saying good morning? Yeah. Uh, it is. I'm breathing hard. I am out of shape. Okay, so <clears throat> when you climb one, when you climb one set of stairs, and you are like having, you know, some sort of a lung capacity attack, you know you're in trouble. So I'm glad you're here this morning. It is beautiful. I got to walk around in my garden this morning and got my feet all dewy and my pajama bottoms were like following me through it. Well, see, here's the deal, all right? When you're built like Barney Rubble and your legs are only this long, pajamas have to be rolled up like six times to keep them, you know, keep them off the floor. So all my pajamas have those little runners on the back, you know, from my heels ripping them up. So I had a new pair on this morning and I'm actually walking through the dew like with, you know, pulling my pant legs up like this, checking my garden. And then when I went downstairs to make my coffee, I looked down and there were literally, literally puddles on the floor where I'd stepped on the dew filled, like you needed to know that, but okay. It was just a beautiful morning this morning. Well, here's the deal. This is what I want us to, this is what I want us to do if we can. We're gonna make a colossal shift. Um, I really want to encourage us to engage this morning um, conversationally with God um, and um, with one another. And so um, as we worship this morning, I, I just would really encourage you to just really soak in uh, what it is we're singing, uh, what it is we're saying, um, and allow it to uh, deeply impact and that's, that's my hope for us this morning, that we would see Jesus in a way that is just fresh and, and new and relational um, and, um, yeah, as beautiful as he is. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and we thank you for your love and we thank you that we can say those things and they come out of our mouths so easily and so quickly. So, Lord, as we actually contemplate what those things mean, may we be overwhelmed. You are the creator God, the mighty king, who has stooped down to look us eye to eye, even in the midst of our darkest places. Your mercy, your mercy looks us right in the eye. We receive from you, we don't receive from you things that we deserve, to be banished from your presence, to be to be punished for our disobedience. But by your mercy, Lord God, you look us in the eye. And then by grace, my Jesus, you give us life. You give us what we don't deserve. And that is life, eternal life, life in you, light and life in you. To know you personally, to know you intimately. You, Jesus, are right here, right now, looking us right in the eye and smiling and saying, good morning, brother. Good morning, sister. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome. So may we sense that this morning in a palpable way. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Thanks, give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. Love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. Love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand. His love endures forever For the life that's been reborn His love endures forever Sing praise Sing praise Let's focus on Him, come on
sing be thou be thou my vision O Lord of my Thank you. 
Father, this morning, um, I would pray that you would fill our senses, that you would overflow our hearts, that you would consume our minds, that the words that we've sung, Lord God, would be the cries of our heart, and that your spirit would respond and continue to form us into the likeness of your Son. So, Jesus, I pray that you would just walk with us, sit with us this morning, put your arm around us, smile. May we sense your very real presence this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. We pray these things. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you're a kid, you need to run to the front and go to class. If you're not a kid, you need to shake a hand, learn a name, say hello. Keep talking for a second. I'm not up front yet. Keep talking. Chat, chat, chat. Have a moment. (laughs) All right. So can I, are all the announcements on slides? Britt, can I stay up here for a minute? All right. A couple of announcements. Don't hurt yourself. I'm up in the balcony on purpose. This is a better looking group than the group I have to look at down there. So... All right. All right, so here we go. Things you might want to know in the pew in front of you, in the back of the pew in front of you, um, there's a pamphlet called Things You Want to Know. So if you're new here, pick up that pamphlet. There are lots of stuff in there that kind of describes Mosaic in different ways. Um, you can learn, what, learn more about us, whether it's the website, our Facebook pages, the various and sundry things that are available to you. There's also a connection card in front of you, and that's for anybody who is, certainly who's new, if, if uh, you want to give us your contact information and a little note about yourself, that would be awesome. If there's places you'd like to serve, you can check those and let us know, and we'll get back to you. If you're a regular here and you've got a change in your contact information, you can put prayer requests, prayer requests you do that on that. You put it in the giving boxes, and the giving boxes are in the narthex behind most of you, or underneath you, or in the hallways up front. Women's Bible studies. We got a couple of them that we got uh, beginning on this this Saturday. Is this Saturday the third already? Is it June third coming up? Oh my goodness gracious! Um, are they? I'm assuming you can still sign up for those if you go if you call the office or go to the website. Uh, but those begin on Saturday. And then summer picnic. This is an awesome time of connection and fellowship. Um, we do this at Walton Lake. I just really would encourage you to come. Bring your kids. It's a blast. It's a good time. Two hours on a Wednesday night on the seventh. Be there. Be square. Or B-square, I suppose. And is there anything else? Oh, robot building contest. Um, Submit your creations in the hub. Voting will begin on June 18th. So I guess there's a way for you to, like, build a robot. And there's a demonstration downstairs. And, um, yeah, submit that. Then young adults, listen, you're not hiking today. And instead, you're having, you're doing board games here at the church. I think the weather is iffy enough that, No one wanted to be caught hiking in a thunderstorm. So I think that's all, right? Anything else? 
Fantastical. This is what I need you to do. If you don't have a Bible, there should be a Bible in the pew in front of you. Grab it if you would, please. You're going to be looking for Mark chapter 9 to start with. You, you will also need your notes, that little paragraph at the top. Um, there are also notes on the YouVersion Live event. Um, but look for Mark 9 real quick, and I'll be uh, moving down. So what have we been doing? We've been doing this series on living a worthy life. And in the, middle, in the midst of living a worthy life, what we're discovering is there are a bazillion things we need to be doing. Not need to be doing, we get to do. To live a life worthy of the call that we have received. And oftentimes, the reason we have to be reminded to do that, or that Paul would remind us in Ephesians to do that, is because sometimes we take for granted who it is we are and who it is we serve. Kind of reflects the prayer I prayed this morning. You know, the fact is that oftentimes we say words like love and mercy and grace, and we thank God for those things without really dwelling on what that means. And the meaning of that is so incredibly profound. It's so incredibly profound that if we're willing to dwell in those thoughts, if we're willing to abide in those truths, just the meditation on those truths, the truth of God and who he is, his grace, his mercy, his grace, his love, who we are because of those things, if we will take the time to truly dwell on those things, they'll change our minds. They'll transform our hearts. They'll change our expectations. They'll lift our eyes from the horizon on this earth to what's to come in the kingdom. Now, I don't know about you, but my life is busy enough, and I have enough stuff going on, and oftentimes my prayer life can be a little hurried or it can be a little oblig obligatory. And so we go through these things, and we... we um, we mention the things we need to mention, and we certainly want to give God praise, but it kind of falls out of our mouths almost like any other word. And if we don't recognize that truth, what we'll miss over time is our heart begins to atrophy just a little bit. It just begins to wax over. And we take for granted the very things that we've been given. You know, I'm constantly reminded in a number of different ways how short this time on earth is. But the only time I truly realize it and then can grasp it and allow that to affect me is when I'm quiet and still. And that the first recollection of that, or the first seeing of that is actually scary. I don't know that I want to know how short my days are, to be honest with you. When I think about my children and I think about my grandchildren, I, frankly, I think about enjoying a sunrise. This morning, I took my coffee into the backyard. I had the dogs running the yard. You know, I, those of you who heard earlier, I had dew, you know, being attached to the bottom of my pants. And I just sat and I watched the sunrise. And that's something I used to do all the time. I would make sure my day always started with watching the sunrise and always ended with watching the sunset. And in those moments, I would reflect on the mercy of my God and the shortness of my time. And the reality that this time is so short that what I need to look forward to, what I must place my hope in, is what is after the sunset. So this morning, I took some time, and I, I had to wrestle with my own heart. I don't know if you guys ever have to do that. But I'm sitting drinking my coffee, and the dogs are annoying me, and the dew is all over my pants. And I watched the sunrise. And I gave my obligatory thank you to God for the sunrise, and I began to watch it, and I realized that my heart was just not sensitive to what I was seeing. And I was having a lot of trouble just receiving God's good morning. And so I repeated back to him how wonderful it is to be his child. And my recognition of being unworthy of his grace and his love. And in a moment, I felt the wax begin to melt off my heart. And I heard his whisper say, I love you. Good morning. Now, it wasn't that he wasn't saying it before. It was that my ears weren't clear enough to hear it, and my heart wasn't soft enough to receive it. So 
See, I think that's the reality of our world and our daily lives and as we go about our business. We say the words that we say because those are the words you say, and we express our thanks and our gratitude and our love, and it comes out of our mouths, and that's wonderful. But most of it, for me anyway, originates in my head and not my heart. You know, I tell men, young men in particular, things all the time. And the first thing I tell young men, when, especially when I'm, when I'm working with them to be married, I look them in the eye and I say, you know what? Men do not know how to love their wives. Now, men love their wives, don't get me wrong. But we don't know how to love our wives. See, our wives teach us how to love them. Our wives teach us how to love. With tenderness and attention and mercy and engagement. Well, our Father is trying to teach us daily how to love him. He loves us, and I love him. We love God. We do. We love God. I don't doubt that for a moment. This is not an admonishment. It's a reminder and an encouragement and a challenge that although we love God, sometimes we don't know how to love God. And the opportunity he gives us daily to take in deep breaths, to see the incredible prism of our atmosphere as the sun rises on the horizon and the light and the color begin to shimmer through that which he has made, that which reflects his heart, his creativity, his imagination, his love. Those things are there for us to see him, to be reminded, and to crack open hard hearts. Does this make sense this morning? So, good morning. How are we this morning? No, good morning. <laughs> Good to see you. We're just going to have a conversation with God. That's what we're going to do. My hope is that our hearts, just the wax on our hearts, melt just a little bit to certainly allow us to reflect to him what it is he's done for us. But that's only because we've received that which he's done for us. I love Johnny. John says, listen, here's the deal. We love because God loved us first. We are capable of love because he loved us first. We are able to love because he loved us first. We love him because he loved us first. He demonstrated love. He is love. Well, here's the deal. What we're going to be doing this morning is we're going to be talking about prayer again. And what we've done, if, if you haven't been here before, you can go back on the Facebook page and, or on our YouTube channel. You can go back and see messages we've done over the course of the last five or six weeks. And what we've done is um, we've been doing a study in Ephesians now, although most of you don't know that, for about 20 months. <laughs> and uh, here's the thing about this. We're stuck on one verse. We've been studying one verse for nine months. And again, you guys don't know that either. But what that one verse is and what that one verse does is it challenges us to take into account that which we ought to be. And that is this, that we are to live a life worthy of the call that we have received. Stop! We're to live a life worthy of the call that we have received. To live a life that reflects our God who called us and drew us to himself and loves us. That same God we're talking about this morning as to whether we can engage, whether we will engage, what, would, what it takes to engage. That this God, this mighty king, this creator God, who is also our father and our brother and our indwelling encourager, this God who calls us is worthy of a life that reflects the name that he has given us and the life that is in us. So the reason we've been on this verse for almost probably six or seven months is because as I read that verse, I thought, oh my goodness, if we're going to live a life worthy of the call, then there are things we ought to be living and reflecting and doing to actually live this out. So, over the last four or five weeks, we've been looking at prayer. And the reason we looked at prayer is we were in Mark chapter 9. So do me a favor, if you're not in Mark chapter 9 yet, find ch Mark chapter 9. And this is what we're going to do in Mark chapter 9. We are going to 
do a quick review on what led us to this point. All right, so we're in verse, um, well, actually go to verse 29 first, if you would. 28, we'll keep it in, keep it in context. Let me pray before we read. Father, we thank you for your word. I, Je Lord Jesus, just open our hearts. J scrape away the wax. Let us join you in the melting of our heart, in the, in the, in the, just to, to, that it might be open to receive what you have, and that we might see you and engage with you this morning. And whatever we bring this morning, Father, whether it's great joy or whether it's great sorrow, may we lay it at your feet. And Father, meet us in the midst of whatever it is, wh wherever it is you find us. And thank you for being that merciful, that gracious, that faithful, and that loving. That you meet each one of us right where we are, just as we need. Father, do that now. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, you ready? So it says in verse 28, it says, After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciple asked him privately, Stop. Okay, so what's the story? What is the story? He says, after Jesus had gone indoors, the disciples asked him privately, why could we not drive this out? Now go back to verse uh, 14. Go back to verse 14. Okay, the phrase says, when they. Well, who's they? They are the disciples, two of the disciples, James and John. Or James, Peter, and John, three of the disciples. And so they had gone up on this mountain with Jesus. His father and Elijah and Moses show up. There's this time of encouragement and time of affirmation. And now they're coming down the mountain talking to one another about what it is they've seen. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and teachers of the law arguing with them. Now I'm going to stop here for a minute because I want us to make sure that those of us who are not here for this, for this portion of what I'm talking about, this passage is about essentially a father who brings a boy to Jesus to have the spirit, an evil spirit, cast from him. And that is, generally speaking, what we look for in this story because that's the, that's the shell of the story. But the, what we, the reason we looked at this passage in, in, in the context of living a life worthy of the call that we have received, the issue here was what is the story actually about and what is the true miracle in this story? And it is how Jesus treated the Father. That we have this beautiful opportunity to live in such a way, to bring honor to God in such a way as to dignify the people around us, to cover and conceal their sin and brokenness, to walk with them. The beautiful thing about this story was, as we looked at it five weeks ago, that Jesus would pull the father away as to protect him, to conceal him, and to dignify him. And his anger, look what it says here. It says, when they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. One of the very rare, rare cases where Jesus doesn't even address the crowd and looks past the crowd to his disciples and asks the question, what are you arguing with them about? What are you arguing with them about? And I'm convinced that his anger had nothing to do with the fact that they were arguing with the Pharisees. He did it all the time. But it was that they would not, that they had a boy, a man and his boy, desperate for help in the midst of this crowd, and they would, they would indignify him in such a way as to argue about them in front of everyone. I think that, why, that is what rose Jesus' anger. So look what it says now. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit. Now, go back down to verse 29 for a minute now. Because we're going to switch the focus just a little bit. Verse 28 again says, After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciple asked him privately, Why could we not drive him out? He replied, This kind, this spirit that I just drove out of the boy only comes out by what? What's that word? Only by prayer. Now, we're going to go back to the top of this text again. And what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to look for, I want you to, as soon as you see Jesus praying or saying a prayer, I want you to raise your hand. Okay, you ready, ready for this? Here we go. Remember, he said it only comes out by prayer. We're at verse 14 again. Here we go. 
So this is, uh, you're allowed to even jump up and shout if you see it, okay? So please. When they, come to, when they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd get, uh, get around them, and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I ask your disciples to drive the, out the spirit, but they could not. Little side note. Prior to this event, the 12 had just been sent out by Jesus two by two with the power to drive out demons. <laughs> They had done this before. This was nothing new for them. Let's keep going. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him to him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has this been going on? How long has he, has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire and water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on me and help us. If you can, Jesus said, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, but help me in my unbelief. When Jesus saw the crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said. I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciple asked him privately, why could we not drive, drive it out? And he said, this kind only comes out by what? Prayer. Prayer. Nobody jumped up. Amen. Nobody raised their hand. Why? Did he gather everybody up and have a real quick prayer meeting before he did this? Did he take the boy to the side and pray over the boy? He didn't, did he? Did he take the father and pray with the father? No. We don't see a prayer, do we? We don't see one. In fact, if we can speculate what the disciples and the Pharisees were probably arguing about, it was probably about prayers. The Pharisees had an entire list of prayers that they used to drive out demons. The disciples had previously experienced the ability to drive out demons. And so the debate they were probably having around the Father was, how do we do, what prayer should we use for this? Isn't that ironic? But Jesus is saying to us, this one only comes out by prayer. So it makes me wonder what kind of prayer he's talking about. What does he mean by prayer? This is a really important question for us. Because what he's saying is there's a different type of prayer than saying prayers. And there are all kinds of prayers, and all these prayers are wonderful. We see the Father's prayer, right? That prayer of exclamation that we studied five years. I do believe, but help me in my unbelief. That's a prayer. We saw a prayer of... A prayer of um, we have, this was a prayer of desperation. We have a prayer of exclamation that we looked at. When, when one of Elisha's interns lost the axe head in the water. Oh my God, that was a borrowed axe. That's a prayer. When we had Kim and Ken up here, and we talked about arguing prayer, the fact that God calls us and we go back and forth about what it is we ought to do in terms of following and being obedient, and that there are prayers that continue to just, we have to grind out over time and persevere. That's a persevering prayer. And an arguing prayer. Last week we looked at Naaman and his stubbornness and his pride. And he didn't want, we didn't want to receive from God what God offered because it was too humiliating. Those were prayers. There are all kinds of prayers and God wants to hear them all. Not too long ago we talked about Peter. And the prayer he told us to pray in 1 Peter chapter 5. Cast your anxieties upon God. Cast them there. We read Philippians 4, the type of prayer that rejoice in the Lord. So prayers of praise. The Lord is near. Prayers of sonship. Thankfulness. Prayers of gratefulness. Prayers and petitions. Seeking and just saying, this is my need. 
There are all kinds of prayers, and all those prayers are wonderful, and they're all necessary, and God delights in those prayers. We need to pray those prayers. But I think there's a type of prayer that Jesus is talking about here that, that, that is the fundamental, the foundation of all of those prayers as we grow more and more in Christ Jesus. So grab your notes and read these, follow along as I read these paragraphs to you. You ready? So you need your notes. Those two paragraphs, just follow along with me. Mark 9.29 says, this, this one comes out only by prayer. And yet there was no prayer or praying evident, none to be seen or heard. So what could Jesus have meant? I believe what Jesus meant by prayer was an attitude of prayer. De developed over time as one trusts the character of God and his working. The prayer I believe Jesus prayed and would demand of his disciples was the prayer I believe Paul speaks of when he says we are to pray continually or unceasingly, developing an ongoing conversation, a give and take, a perpetual exchange, a perpetual exchange. Praying in such a way as to not only ask, seek, and knock, but also listen, listen. That we have communed in prayer with our Heavenly Father, we have developed almost a natural attentiveness, a listening ear, almost like we have been programmed or adjusted to God's frequency or his wavelength. And in so we learn to abide in that state. It's much like when we're driving along in our car, what we don't realize is when we tune into a radio station and we drive from here to Chicago and we can maintain a particular radio station, it's because either satellites or towers are enabling us to jump from one to the next and listening to that station. There's a wavelength, you know, if you have serious radio, if you're even talking on your cell phone. As we move, it remains in frequency and it just bounces from tower to tower or from satellite to satellite. No different with our heart with God. That as we go from circumstance to circumstance, we go from moment to moment. A heart that is in, tu in tune with him, a heart that is, 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 um, is tuned into his frequency. Regardless of where we go, there's this incredible bouncing back and forth. And we remain tuned in. That, as we have communed in prayer with our Heavenly Father, we have developed almost a natural attentiveness, a listening ear, almost like we have been programmed or adjusted to God's frequency or wavelength. And then so we learn to abide in that state. We learn to remain there. We speak, we hear, we listen, we exchange wishes with our Father almost naturally. And through this time, this effort, this practice, we learn something more. We learn that his greatest wish for us, we learn that his greatest wish for us is that thing which he shares with us that he gives us in exchange for all that we bring to him. And that is this, his will, his desires, his developing in us the desire to see his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And as we learn to pray according to that will, we grow in trust that our Father does love us, He does hear us, and what He wants for us is more than we can ever dream or imagine. We learn to trust our Father that He is good. I think this is the type of prayer that Jesus is talking about. I think it's an abiding prayer. I think it's a prayer that, that has us so tuned into the frequency of God that no, no matter what the circumstance, we begin to hear what it is that he is saying to us. So this is what I want to do. Go to Matthew chapter 7, if you would. I want to go to Matthew chapter 7. I love that sound. That is music to my ears. Awesome. Ready? Oh, okay. I'm going to pray again because my heart is fluttering. Father, thank you for the, your word. I just, Father, just commune with us and teach us and let us, make us susceptible to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so verse 7. So in Matthew 7, verse 7, it says this. It says, ask and it will be given to you. 
Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives and everyone who finds and, and the one who seeks finds and to the one who knocks the door will be open. Stop! Isn't that an awesome prayer? Whatever, whatever I ask for, whatever I'm seeking, any door that I knock on, God will respond. Now, what does he mean by this? <sighs> Remind me that my iPad goes with me, okay? All right, so. It says, ask and will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks will receive, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks the door will be opened. It says, which of you, if, you, if, you, if, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone or... He asks for fish, you will give him a snake. And if then, though you are evil, you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything you do, stop. So ask, seek, and knock. Here's the thing. The question I would ask is this. What are we asking and seeking and knocking for? What are we looking for? What are we asking of God? One of the concerns that I have is that most of the time our asking and our seeking have to do with us and what we want. Isn't that true? Oh, nearly, I would say, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's just me, but I would say that the, very, the bulk of prayers, the bulk of my praying, oftentimes has to do with asking for things and seeking out what it is that God would have for me. And any door that I'm knocking on, I want open so that I can get that which I've asked for and that's which I'm seeking. And that is the bulk of our prayers. And it looks like that's what Jesus is saying here. Ask and you'll get it. Seek, and you'll find it. Knock, and I'll open the door to you. All the storehouses of God available to me, that whatever I've asked for, I can grab, and whatever I'm seeking, I can get. Whatever door that I knock on, he'll open and let me pass through it. But what is, it, what is he talking about? See, I don't know that he's talking about stuff. Uh, no, no, stop for a minute. I don't know that he's talking about stuff. And if you are where I am right now, my brain just went, Kick, like this. You know, that, Kick, ah, ah. Because then we have to say, well, we, uh, what? If I'm so programmed as a human being to make sure that what I'm asking for and what I'm seeking is somehow a relief to whatever my desires are, for me to think of this, you know, praying otherwise almost makes my brain like lock up in my head and go, I, then, I, yeah, then I'm not sure. Oh, And I think that's important for us to recognize. That's an important feeling for us to feel. Because what it's telling us is maybe, maybe, maybe what God is asking us to do as we learn to trust him more and more, as we're more and more persuaded of the truth of who he is, as we're more and more convinced that he is who he says he is and will do what he says he'll do, that our hearts and minds will be attuned to his and our lives and our, and, and our focus will be transformed. And in that will be changed. And it'll even change, listen to me, it'll even change our prayers. How often are we disappointed by our prayers that we didn't get what we expected to get? How often do we pray and the answer seems no, 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 way more than yes, 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 yes? How often? How often do we blame God for something when we've prayed and we've prayed earnestly and we've prayed in faith and we think that we should get, we, we've asked and we've sought and we knocked on the door, but, and Jesus said, we, what? How often? And I would ask the question, could it be that we're looking for the wrong thing? Are we asking for the wrong thing? Now, don't get me wrong. God wants us to ask, and he wants us to seek, and he wants us to knock. Those prayers are real, true, necessary, and God delights in the fact that his children would come. But I think there's something way more fundamental than this. There's something foundational to this. There's something that sh this house of prayer should be built on, that should never be replaced. Neither should it be buried in the ground. Go back to verse 7 again. It says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. You know what I think he's talking about? I don't think he's talking at all about what our needs are. I don't think he's talking at all about what we want. I don't, think he's, I don't think this is, an, is addressing in any way the desires of our hearts. You know what I think it is? I think he wants us to search out his heart. 
What, he's, what we're asking for in this prayer is to see him and know him. What we're seeking in this prayer is his heart. The door we're knocking on is his door. The promise that he's giving in regarding to answer that if you will seek my face, if you'll ask for me and you will seek my face and you'll knock on my door, all three of those will be answered. All three. Now it's interesting if we go on. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives and everyone who seeks finds and to the one who knocks the door will be open. Then he says something very interesting in verse 9. So he's speaking, in, in, to me, he's speaking to both types of prayer. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if for fish, it would give him a snake. Now think about this for a minute. Well, this is what I want us to see. Do you know what? When we think of, <laughs> when we think of bread, so if, we, if my son asks for bread, we go Wonder Bread, right? With the balloons all over the page, and we open the plastic bag, and we hand him a piece of bread, and that's what's in our sight. Because what is he using here? He's using stuff that they have on hand to say, this is, this is what you're asking for. But you know what a loaf of bread looked like that he's talking about? Because the, the bread we eat doesn't look much like a stone, does it? So why would he make this comparison? Well, the bread, he's, he's talking to poor people. The poor man's bread in the New Testament in Jesus' time were these little, like, rough-hewn barley uh, loaves that you could actually put in your pocket. They would carry them in little satchels. And that's what they would take with them for the journey so that they could just bite off a piece, and, and it would, you'd chew on that thing for a while. And you know what they look like? A stone. See, it's really important for us to get this because the rest, of, the rest of this message doesn't make any sense. The rest of what he's talking about doesn't make any sense if we don't see why he used a stone and bread as the example. Because oftentimes I ask for something and I get something that looks a little bit like but wasn't anything like what I expected. Or the answer looks, I, it is what I expected, but it doesn't look what I thought, like what I thought it would be. Why does he compare a fish to a snake? They both have scales. There's a resemblance. What Jesus is saying is, what good father, what father would ever give his boy a rock when he asked for a piece of bread? And in the mind of the Palestinian, they're, they, they're, 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 those in Palestine, is they're holding this, this, this loaf of this little brown piece of bread that looks exactly like a stone. And when he says fish and, and he says snake, he looks at it and he goes, these have scales. And the nature is much the same. So then he goes on. Look what it says. We're looking for a word here. Ready? Which of you, who, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? If he asks for fish, will he give him a steak? Verse 11. If you then, though you are evil... Know how to give what? Good gifts. Stop. Here's the rub, isn't it? Because this is where our prayers and God's character collide. I think we struggle with imagining that God is good. I think we struggle when we see what's going on in our world, when we've asked for bread and it appears as though he's given us a stone, I think we don't trust that God, listen, is good. See, here's the issue with prayer. When we pray, we're praying to God. We're hoping maybe he'll hear us. And if maybe he'll hear us, there's a chance he might what? Answer. And that maybe that answer would meet what we're asking. And our hope is that this God who seems so distant to whom I pray when I have such need, our hope is that maybe he'll love us enough to do this. You know what we've taken out of account? You know what we have not taken into account? We have not taken into account that God, listen, God is God good. Stop it. 
God is good. You know what it means when we say God is good? It's in, he is incapable of doing anything other than what is good. His very nature, his very character is goodness. Therefore, he can't do anything that isn't. Boy, that's hard to see. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. When he said, what one of you dads, when your boy comes and asks for bread, would give him a stone? And what he's saying is, listen, you who are evil know how to give what? Good gifts. You would give your son the right thing. But at the time, it didn't seem like, like what the boy was asking for. We've used this analogy before. As parents, we recognize that our children are going to ask for things, and we so desperately would like to say yes, but we realize we can't give them the thing they're asking for because we know in the long run it is not going to be to their benefit. Right? And so out of goodness toward our children, we do not give them the thing they're asking. We give them something that might appear as though it, what it is what they were asking for, and in the long run, they're better for it. And we can't necessarily explain it to them in the t at the time because it would not make sense. But over time, as they begin to realize what it is that we've done for them, hopefully, they'll come back and say, you know what? Remember that time? Wow. So it is with our Father in heaven. If we who are evil know how to do that well, how much better does a good father know how to do such things? And in fact, he's so good, he's incapable of not doing it. Think about that. You know, there's an old philosophical conundrum that you, people used to say, if God is really God and he can do anything, can he make a rock so big that he himself can't pick it up? <sighs> right? Well, see, the presupposition to that question is completely wrong. In fact, the manner behind it is mischievous at best, if not just plain out belligerent. But the fact of the matter is, listen to me, God can't do just anything. He can't. You know why? His character will not allow it. And his character is goodness, and therefore he cannot do things that are not good. Let's keep going. This will change the way we pray, by the way. This will change the way we abide. This will change the way we commune. This will change how we respond to our... This will change over time how it is we respond to what we might consider a prayer unanswered or prayer answered in a way we didn't expect or prayer answered the way we didn't want. This will change over time as we're persuaded more and more, as we're more and more convinced, as we experience God more and more. This will begin to change us. Watch this. Man, I'm glad we have all morning. Whew. All right. So look what it says. So verse 9 again, it says, Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will you give him a stone? If he asks for a snake, fish, will you give him a snake? And if you then, you who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Now listen, I'm I looked in the original language to this word good. And listen to what it means. Listen to the definition. It means good. It means intrinsically good. Good from the inside out. Good that is thoroughly and utterly good. Good in nature. Listen to this one. Good whether it is seen to be so or not. That's the definition of good. Good whether it would seem so or not. This is the word good that Jesus uses with these people. That sometimes when we pray, we ask and we seek and we knock, what God is doing is he's answering those prayers, but he's answering them in ways that don't seem good at the time, but are actually are. And the reason they actually are is because God being good cannot do anything that isn't. And we in our finiteness and really our, our sinful flesh have a lot of difficulty comprehending that. So we go on, watch. Verse 12. So then he says something very interesting. It seems out of place. So in everything you do, do to others as you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. What is he saying? Act like me. That anything you would do, anything you would want done to you, you do for somebody else. And God is saying, I am so good that that's how I view everyone, everything, all the time. All the time. You act accordingly. 
as you now know me, as you learn to pray, now you treat others as you would want to be treated, just as I have treated you. And I love you. And everything I do for you, because I love you, is good. Even if it does, listen, even if it doesn't seem like it. And this is really important. See, ultimately what Jesus is doing here, whether we know it or not, is setting the disciples up for watching his crucifixion, right? Because it didn't, it didn't seem good at the time, did it? Peter, in fact, tried to stop him from going, didn't he? Hmm. Go to Luke chapter 12 now. Go to Luke chapter 12. Because what I want us to do is I want us to see what the seeking is all about. We've got to hurry because we've got to go to lunch. So, okay, Ready? Verse 22, Luke 12, verse 22. I want us to see something here. It says, Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not what? About your what? Life. Oh! Ask, seek, and knock. Ask, seek. Stop. No. Hear this. Ask, seek, and knock. Jesus said, don't worry about your life. Hmm. Jesus said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Ask, seek, and knock. Consider the ravens, do they, not, they do not store or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God does what? He feeds them. No, stop it. This is really hard for us to grasp, guys. That bread that he mentions in Matthew, that little loaf of bread that they would carry in their pocket, that was sometimes a day's worth of rations. We have refrigerators, most of us, plural in our home, full of whatever it is we need, and we go there anytime we want. He's talking to poverty-stricken people who live from meal, day to day, if not meal to meal. The bread that he speaks of that looks like a rock, they're praying for that because they need to pray for that, because they don't have that. And so when a boy asks for a loaf of bread, he's saying, can I have my lunch? And that loaf of bread is the size of a Reese's Easter egg, which is my favorite, by the way. Something you carry in your pocket. And so he's saying, would any father whose boy asks him for lunch give him a stone? So look in this context. It says, therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life. Stop it. What you'll eat or what your body, what you'll wear. You know, when we do missions, oftentimes we go to families who are po so poverty stricken, they have, they, have, they have wearing clothes and washing clothes. You know what we mean by that? They wear what they wear today, and they wash what they're going to wear tomorrow, and then they switch it. And usually they switch it once a week. I have 42 shirts that look just like this. I find them for three bucks a piece, and I buy a whole rack. Because they're comfortable, and that's all that matters to me. I ain't pretty. I don't have to worry about that. I got like 40 of these things. Some of them are from the 1980s. I'm not lying. Okay, so here we go. Vintage my butt. You just buy, you just keep your clothes. All right, so here we go. <laughs> so it's therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat, or your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They're outside. They're listening to him speak, and they turn, and I'm sure what had happened was a raven flew over the top of the, and they heard the call of the raven, and Jesus pointed up, and he looked. He said, now consider the raven. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn yet. God feeds them, and how much more valuable you are than, he's making an exclamation. He's exclaiming this now. He's making a proclamation. Look what it says. How much more valuable you are than birds. He's telling them. He is making sure they understand their value in God's economy. It isn't that birds are not important to God. It's that we're that much more important to God. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Ask, seek, knock. 
Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Why are you so concerned? Now it gets better, watch. Consider how the wildflowers grow. They do not labor or spend, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor, not the wealthiest, most powerful king per capita in the history of the world. Not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. Stop. A dandelion. A little, a little lily. A buttercup. How splendid, how beautiful, how fragrant. Look what it says. Verse 28. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Don't do that. Do not ask, seek, knock. Do not set your heart, your affections, your full attention, your engagement. Don't. He says, do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Don't worry about it. Stop it. For the pagan world, those who do not know God, for the pagan world runs, runs after all such things. They run. You know what the, I get in my head when I read this verse? Black Friday, 2011. People pressing in against doors, doors breaking, people being trampled, punched in the face. Think about it. Think about the behavior of humanity and how it is we conduct ourselves. And Jesus said, stop running around like that. Stop. The, the world who does not know God runs after all these things. And there's reason for it. They don't know God. And so their stomach is their God. And so they race everywhere to get that which they think they need, and I got to have, and boom, and we'll do anything we need to do and who, I got over the top of anybody we need to do it. They say, don't. Stop it. We're consumed by it. And that's what he means by setting your heart on it. For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your father, wow! What's it say? Read it. Your father what? Your father what? He knows. He knows that you need them. He knows. He just got telling us that he feeds the ravens, and we have far greater value than the ravens. He already told us how he clothes the grass, and we are far greater worth than the grass. Now he's saying, listen, stop worrying about your life and your body and where you're going to da 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 He says, your father knows that you need them. Ask, seek, knock. So let's stop here for a minute. Man, I wish we had more time. Let's ask this question then. If my dad knows, why pray? Seriously. He already knows. Ravens aren't praying. The grass ain't praying. Why pray? Hmm. This is really important. You ready? I'm going to get through this quickly. Bear with me. Why pray? Well, first of all, we could say obedience. If you love me, you'll obey my commands. The command is to pray, so we pray. Awesome. Obligatory, but we're praying. Certainly, it could be to honor our Father. There's no greater honor than I can receive than when my children come to me for help or to talk or to do something. Yes, so I'm honoring my dad. Awesome, and those are good. We should be obedient. We should pray, and we should honor our parents, and we should honor God. What's next? Being an imitator of Christ, therefore, is dearly loved children. What does that look like? He prayed, so I should pray. Amen. Right? Amen. Good stuff. Do it. There's lots of reasons to pray, lots of good reasons to pray, lots of necessary reasons to pray, but there's a fundamental reason why we pray. Guess what it is? What is prayer? It's an exchange of wishes. Ultimately, what prayer is is an exchange of wishes, an exchange. I give to God my wishes, and what does he do in response? He gives me what I want. That's how we look at it, isn't it? Ask, seek, knock, and you'll get what you want. No! We, we use that phrase and it says, exchange of wishes. Where am I putting the emphasis? On the what? Exchange of wishes. Wishes. You know where the emphasis belongs? On the exchange. You know why? Because when I give him my wishes, guess what he's doing? He's giving me his wishes. Uh-oh. God, no, no, no. It's an exchange. 
I give him my wishes. Oh, no. Then I give his wishes. And what is his wish? Ask Seek Knock. Watch this. Verse 30, for the pagan world runs after all such things, and your father knows that you need them, but seek his kingdom, and these things will be... Whoa! Seek what? Seek what? Seek what? No, we don't want to say that out loud now, do we? Seek what? Seek his kingdom. You know what his kingdom is? His heart. His kingdom is his person. His kingdom is his purposes that flow from his person. His kingdom is his will that accomplishes those purposes that come and flow from that person. We're to seek his kingdom. We're to seek his face, his heart, his will, and his purposes. And guess what that is, my friends? Guess what that is? That's the exchange. That's the exchange. That as I offer him my wishes, what he says to me is, that's wonderful, son. I love you, and I'll do my best for you. I'm going to give you the best thing I can give you. Here's my will. Here's my heart. Here's my purposes. What does the Lord's Prayer say? Our Father, you're in heaven. Holy is your name. Your kingdom come. You're what? Seeking the kingdom. Your what? Will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. Oh no. Oh no. Ask, seek, knock. It's asking to know God better. It's seeking his heart and it's knocking on the door of his throne room. That's what it is. And if we will ask for him and we'll seek him out and we knock on his door, he will respond. And the fact of the matter is, is when we seek, what, what is prayer then? What is the purpose of prayer? It is not for us necessarily to get everything we want. The purpose of prayer is for this thing and this thing alone. That he, in that exchange of wishes, receives from us what it is we're asking for, telling him, needing, and then he says to us, now, give me your heart. I'm going to bend it toward me. Give me your heart. I'm going to bend it toward my will. And you know what that does to our prayers? It changes them. He is a good father who is intrinsically good, and everything that he does is good. And as we seek, as we ask for him and his will and his kingdom, as we seek that out and we knock on that door and we do that persistently and he meets us in the midst of that, our prayers begin to change. Our hearts begin to change. We become, we become attuned to him. And all of a sudden we realize, even in those times when we are giving him exchange, and we do need, and we do want, and we do, because those prayers are important and necessary, and he wants to hear, he delights in those prayers. We will begin to understand more and more why the answer isn't exactly what we thought. That this good God gave me something that doesn't seem good, but it must be good because I know my God and he is good. Amen? We need to sing. Stand up. Band, get in place. I'm going to pray while the band gets in place. Whew! Father. Father. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you for meeting us. When we ask, Lord God, it's not just you giving us a stone or even a piece of bread, a fish or a snake. But, Father, you give us your person. You give us your heart. You give us, you give us your will. You are a good Father. You are good. And because you're good, Lord, teach us to know, persuade us, convince us. That because of your goodness that everything you do is good, you can't not do good, even though it seems as though it isn't good, Lord, it is good. And we can trust that. We can know that. So, Father, as we learn to pray and abide in prayer, Father, yes, we're going to ask, and yes, we're going to seek, and yes, we're going to knock, and we're going to present to you our petitions and our wants and our needs. And, Father, we know you delight in those things, but, Lord, change our heart to seek your face, to seek your kingdom, to seek your will. Tune us into your Spirit, Lord God, guide us in the way we should go. May that, my God, be the essence of our prayers. May we abide in that. And so, Father, when Jesus said these only come up a prayer, remind us that what it is is not a prayer over that thing. It's continual communion with you and a recognition of your goodness and your response to a humble and broken heart before you. And full recognition of your mercy 
that did not punish us, and your grace that gives us life, and your love that sustains us, and the hope that we have, that these days might be short, but we will be with you in eternity. And may your will be done. And we reluctantly, in a very real way, pray that you would begin with us. But Lord, do it anyway. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing.
longs to hear our voice, who longs for us to engage with you, who longs for us to ask, to seek, and to knock. But help us to see this fundamental truth, that what your greatest desire is, is so that we wouldn't ask you for stuff all the time, but that we would, we would ask to know you and seek out your heart and knock on the door of your throne. That we, Lord God, would let you share yourself with us. That we would know you more. And Father, as we do that, we will learn to abide in that and to hear your voice and to listen closely and to be in constant communion with you and frequency with you. So Father, thank you for answering every prayer and thank you for longing to hear our voice. But remind us, Lord Jesus, that you are good, you are good, and everything you give us is good even when it doesn't seem like it's good because you love us. So help us this week to seek you out with our whole heart, our whole mind, our soul, our whole body. Thank you for listening and wanting to be with us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.